You're listening to the Cycling Podcast, brought to you by iWoka. Flexible loans built for small businesses. iwoca.co.uk. Hello, my name's Richard Moore, back again for another week of the Cycling Podcast with Daniel Freib in silhouette. Hello, Daniel. Hello. Silhouette isn't a part of London. It is uh, I, all I can see is a dark, the dark outline of Daniel's voluminous hair, um, which I guess nothing's going to change on that uh, front in the near future. And less voluminous Lionel Burney. <laughs> well, less voluminous hair, perhaps. Certainly, that's indisputable. Yeah. Um, the the beard keeping that under control? No, not really. Not really. I've sort of given up on given up. Really, I've given up. Given up. You still got the bike heading for the dartboard there. Yeah, on the back of your wall. How are you both, yeah. chaps? Not too bad. Not too bad, Buff. How are you? Good. Good. I rode to um, uh, Formentor yesterday, the lighthouse in Majorca. Nice to get out of London for a bit, in my imagination, at least. I was on the RGT platform. You familiar with it? Um, yes, we are. We're becoming, we're having to become very familiar with all these different platforms, aren't we now? Uh, Ruby, um, Swift, you see I've been, I've been swatting up. We do, we've tended to um, use Zwift, haven't we, as a, as a sort of verb, as a, a, a bit like Hoover, uh, when you should say vacuum, we say Zwift, when we should say other platforms are available. I used to use another one back in the day when I was um, an adeptee of turbo training. That was just my imagination. I used <laughs> to just pretend that I was Pavel Tonkov, you know, on the on the Stelvio or the Gavio or the Mortirolo. You know, that worked quite well, I, I found. Well, we'll be hearing about that, Daniel, in, a, in an imminent Friends special. Um, meet Daniel Frieb, Daniele Friberancini. Um we yeah more details on that in the next week or so but um our producer tom wally is, that, is, is he, this a joke no it's not a joke you remember before <laughs> lockdown you and i met in a cafe in london and I we had a vaguely remember we had a lo- <laughs> vaguely remember we had a long chat about about you and about your life in in cycling and journalism and uh tom wally our producer has been beavering away on that and th- says he thoroughly enjoyed it um wow. and he said w- well done for carving him open <laughs> wow wow so, <laughs> So, or prizing him open, sorry, prizing him open. Anyway, um, that, Did, that I'm not sure we ever got. I'm not sure we got to disclosing my former turbo trainer routine oh yeah, we did. on there. Did we? Oh yeah, oh, did yeah, we? yeah. That, that's in there. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that's coming soon for friends of the podcast. A real treat. That I should that should prompt a flurry of signups. I would imagine. Of, uh, yeah, cancels, <laughs> cancellations. Anyway, go on. <laughs> so anyway, I, I wrote. Uh, I say yeah. I wrote to um, Foreman Toy yesterday, and I found it really quite enjoyable because i know that rode extremely well um and i could really i did really feel like i was i was there i know all the hills and the, it's it's a nice ride there's mont von two on there as well i thought that might um, might take mm. your fancy lionel yeah i did notice that actually um well we had our own virtual ride on sunday didn't we richard you joined you joined us um tom wally who you mentioned our producer and host of service course joined us so did hannah troop from explore simon the photographer tv's rob hatch we didn't manage to entice daniel to run along with us i haven't got a um, bike well you can run you can run on on zwift other platforms are available if you own um, a, a treadmill it, uh, <laughs> you can't uh, just yeah, ju- run on the spot <laughs> <laughs> now that would be good um but it was good, wasn't it? We rode around Virtual Central Park for an hour. And, Quite tough. Uh, we're going to do it again. Quite tough Central we're, Park, isn't it? It was, yeah, it was. Talking of, of living in the, the virtual world, I've been having very, very regular contact with Chiro. We've been talking multiple times a day. Um, and Chiro is very concerned, obviously, about um, not being able to escape to one of his beloved beaches at the moment. And um, we came to the, the resolution that the only thing for him would be to have a virtual holiday, an e-holiday. So Chiro, at some point in the next couple of months, is just going to find an appropriate spot on Google Earth. And he's going to pull up a deck chair in front of his laptop. And he's just going to he's just going to sit there for a couple of weeks. Fantastic. <laughs> Well, I mentioned that ride, Richard, our non-drop um, 11 o'clock cappuccino ride. 
Uh, we're doing it again on Sunday. Uh, the ride starts at 10 o'clock in the morning. We're using the Zwift platform, but we might use other platforms in future weeks. Um, it's a non-drop ride, uh, which basically means you can't be dropped by me. I'm, uh, the, I'm the ride leader. And uh, there's 100 places available if anyone wants to join us for the meetup. And this is how you can join us on Sunday morning, 10 o'clock, British summer time. First of all, you have to follow me on Zwift. I'm in there as Lionel Burney. And then once you've followed me on Zwift, email contact at thecyclingpodcast.com with the subject title Cappuccino Ride. And in the email, just tell me what your name on Zwift is. Uh, once all the places are filled up, I'll set up the meetup for 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. The, um, the, the usual caveats apply. Once it's full, it's full. If you're not following me on Zwift at the time when I'm trying to set up the meetup, I'm very sorry, but uh, I won't be able to invite you. So do join us. We'll see you. Uh, I don't know which course to use on Sunday. Well, it'll be Lucky Dip. Um, L- Lionel, is that that you, you can't be dropped? One can't be dropped by you under the rules of the, the game or is it physically impossible to get dropped by you generally? <laughs> It's, uh, <laughs> well, both. Both, both apply. Daniel, I can say. Um, what it means is that the person who, if you set up a non-drop ride, it means that no one can kind of uh, go off the back. You can ride, go forward if you want and, and ride as hard as you like um, and still you'll still be in the ride. I mean, you all left me behind, didn't you? It's a bit like real life. Yeah. You powered off. We were, we were surely, racing with Simon. Surely there's a, a one of the Cofidis boys or Wanty group go bear. Um, rider is allowed to go down the road for a couple of hours and you know hang out to dry no <laughs> keep it realistic yeah we'll see if you Fredo uh joins us so you email in contact at the cycling podcast.com is that right lionel that's right do, do you uh, have to send sure... your cappuccino email before 11 o'clock in the morning no you can you can sign up at any time this cappuccino the, i've called it the cappuccino ride just to get a rise out of daniel really just to just to annoy him the ride finishes at 11 o'clock 11 just in time for an 11.05, just in time for a cappuccino. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. So what have we got coming up uh, in this week's episode, chaps? Um, we're going to hear from Michael Woods, who broke his leg at Paris-Nice and is recovering from that and obviously dealing with everything else, including a, a newborn baby. And, um, well, he's had a great record in Liège-Bastogne-Liège the last couple of years. So we're going to talk a little bit about Liège-Bastogne-Liège, which would have been this weekend. Um, we're going to hear once again from Larry Warbass in lockdown and we'll hear from Geraint Thomas as well in the final part uh, about his ride to raise money for the NHS on the Turbo Trainer. Three 12-hour shifts he did. So we'll hear from him in part whatever it is. Three? You're listening to The Cycling Podcast brought to you by iWaka. Flexible loans built for small businesses. Join 50,000 customers taking on life's twists and turns and scaling new heights with iWalker. If you run a business, find out more at iWalker.co.uk. I-W-O-C-A.co.uk. iWalker are the Cycling Podcast title sponsors, and we would like to say a very big thank you to them for their support this year. The coronavirus crisis means that this is a very worrying time for many businesses, especially small businesses. And this week we're going to hear from iWalker's Chief Operating Officer about how the company is adapting to the current extraordinary circumstances. Hi, I'm Seema and I'm the Chief Operations Officer at iWalker. We're in this together. You know, when our customers suffer, so do we. Uh, if we suffer, so do our lenders. So we all need to work together to get through this. You know, we had some record-breaking days in terms of um, call volumes and emails that we were getting from our customers. Um, and we've had to move people around internally to get on the phones um, to help us speak to our customers. It's so important in these times when things are changing and you know our customers are concerned about their loans or their access to finance, that you know, they have somebody to talk to. We're, we're all in this together and we're absolutely trying to do everything that we can to help. It's absolutely critical that we understand the businesses that we serve. You know, our customers, we, we need to understand them, they're, they're why we exist, and you know, we need to understand them as well as we possibly can if we're going to serve them really well. You know, when we're talking to our customers who, who call us or when we call them, you know, we really try and understand as much as we can about their current circumstances um, and also try and ad- advise them too and make them aware of some of the government support that's already out there, some of the grants, um, you know, which organisations are able to provide government funding at the moment you know talking to them about the furlough scheme just to make sure that they're aware of what's out there and giving them this information 
um, to help them. If you'd like to find out more about iwaka, go to iwaka.co.uk. That's I-W-O-C-A dot co dot UK. Snow Fears the films we used to know And the little park where we would go Sleeps far below in the snow Gone, it's all over and you're gone But the memory lives on Although our dreams lie buried Sometimes the wind blows through the trees And I think I hear you calling me But all I see is snow Everywhere I go Are the cold winter sun sinks low I ride Alone through the snow Well guys, you might remember that the probably the greatest Liege Baston Liege ever, or at least in in living memory, um was the one won by Bernardino uh, in the snow. Uh, in the beginning of the 80s, um, well, for me, it was probably one of the most fantastic rides ever, one of the most incredible feats, you know, ever achieved by a, by a rider in a one-day race. Um, riding in the snow is not something that's quite common. It's, it always provides, you know, uh, uh, events, ex- uh, excitement in uh, one-day races or in stage races. And this particular liege basson Liege in the snow one by Eno you know, alone in the in the storm was quite a, quite a fabulous moment. So I wanted to pay the homage to uh, to that feat with this song, "Snow," which is a song by Randy Newman, one of the greatest uh, composers ever, and it was made roughly popular by uh, by Harry Nilsson. Um, so there you are. That was my song for the week. I hope you liked it, and uh, well, uh, see you or you know, uh, <laughs> sing to you. Uh, next time cheers guys bye well francois thomaso with another inspired selection well inspired in this on this occasion by uh, bernardino's very famous liege baston liege win in 1980 when he rode through the snow um to win by almost 10 minutes uh in the end i think only 20 riders finished that race um and it has gone down in history as one of the one of the great editions of Liège Bastion Liège. And the funny thing about that, thinking about it, was I wonder, you know, at, at the time it was probably a bit of a disappointing race. You know, it, you know, there wasn't really much racing. It was just a a war of attrition and a battle for survival. Um, Eno just kept going almost in order to keep warm. He wanted to pack a few times. He argued with his DS, Cyril Guimar, who wanted him to take his rain jacket off um, so that the sponsors were visible. <laughs> Eno refused. And it's uh, it's kind of it's kind of famous and epic in retrospect, I think, isn't it? Because I bet at the time it's a bit, reminds me a bit of the famous Stage 19 at the Tour de France last year, which was cancelled, of course. And at the time, everybody's, Emotion was one of disappointment and frustration, but over time, events like that, drama like that, goes down in the in the annals as something a little bit different and exceptional, and that's kind of what makes it um, a, a, a race and addition that we still talk about. Yeah, I think so, Rich. I mean, just the course of the age itself. Obviously, it's been changed uh, in various ways and at various times over the years, but um, I, I sort of still consider it. 
the ultimate test of, of pure athletic ability in a cyclist. It's it's that hard. Um, I, I don't know whether this is slightly misplaced and uh, misguided, but I, I still sort of look at first and second year pros, if ever they get thrown into Liège, how they fare, whether they're able to finish the race. And I always think that's a, an interesting gauge of you know how sort of um, resilient they are um, it doesn't always hold true doesn't always predict a great future for them but um, it's certainly um, one of the, the toughest tests of, of endurance in one day races um, on the calendar and you know add in the the weather the that um, the peloton had that day I mean, it, it does add up to, I think, probably the the most memorable edition of the last 20, 30, sorry, well, it's not last 20 years, is it? The, the most memorable edition 40. In, um, yeah, in recent memory. 40 years ago, that was <laughs> extraordinary. A very little footage seems to exist of it online there's a there's a few minutes of the the race from belgian tv on youtube you can see a lot of snow on the sides of the road and snow kind of settling on the riders as well because it was a, it was blizzardy at points but surprising number of spectators out on the side of the road watching um, so you know it's uh, it's not a, it's not something that we've seen an awful lot of and i think that goes back to something daniel often says about the the kind of the mystique of the sport being uh, when when the stories can be told without the uh, without the, the 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 drama of it necessarily being shattered by seeing TV pictures of it, don't you think it's uh, significant that the winner was Eno, and it's so it's part of the the Eno legend as well as part of the Liege Baston Liege legend. Had it been Henny Kuiper or you know a, a, a less well known rider, I um, mean you know, I'm thinking an equivalent race quite recently was the world championships in in harrogate where mads pedersen was the winner now mads pedersen a good strong rider but perhaps not destined to be a great like Eno was and so the identity of the winner always has a bearing too i think on how the race is looked back on and how it's revered or not you mean it would have been a, almost a, a sort of freak edition rather than something that has added to yes. the luster of Eno's yes. or, or Gerald yeah. Chilek at Milan mm. San Remo is maybe another good example. You know, had it been Tom Bonin who won that Milan San Remo, maybe it would have it would be one that, that that's held up a bit more as a you know as a an epic day, a great day in the history of the race. Yeah, I think it's another one um upon which you know layer after layer of, of mythology um, has been added in subsequent years as well. And, I, you know, at the time, I don't know how much was known about the sort of conversations that had gone on between Eno and Guimard, who, Cyril Guimard, who um, is also sort of a legendary figure, a legendary figure of that that era. Um, but, but you know, those conversations are very much part of the, the folklore that's grown around that race and that addition. And the other thing about it, I think, is that it was a sort of emblematic performance of Hino at his absolute best. I mean, Rich, you'd have a more of a view on this, um, a, a more insight into this than us, maybe. But was the 1980 version of Eno the best Eno? Well, it, it's a funny one, that, because it was a, an up-and-down year. Um, he won Liege based on Liege he then you know it was a year where he put in his two most outstanding one day performances um, at the world championships in Salonche you know arguably one of the toughest ever world championships and in Liege based on Liege but at the Tour de France he was um, disappointed and disappointing because he had to pull out with a knee injury um, which may have had something to do with the ordeal of, of riding Liege based on Liege you know he had a lot of um health issues after that with his fingers being frostbitten and um, his knee problem may have been exacerbated by his efforts that day. Um, but he came back from the, the Tour to win the World Championship in a similar, very domineering fashion um, with a, just a strong man's performance. So it was probably the best of Eno in a, a one-day sense, but you know, ultimately a disappointing year for him in the, in the Grand Tours. I mean, I asked that partly because 
we're talking about um, very memorable editions of Liège Baston Liège, and the one that you know when we were talking about this episode and and thinking about picking one out, the one that came to my mind, 1970, um, won by Roger de Vlaminck, old chum of ours, um, relived beautifully by Roger de, de Vlaminck in his kitchen when I visited him a few years ago with a, um, a series of. Where he brought out the, his best china, the coffee cups, put them on the kitchen table, and he, he sort of simulated um, the sprint in the old velodrome in Liège. Um, Three-man sprint, Roger de Vlaminck, Eric de Vlaminck, and Eddie Merckx. And Eddie Merckx was very upset because he thought that Eric de Vlaminck had obstructed him, allowing Roger de Vlaminck um, to win. Um, this came after well, an edition of um, Paris-Roubaix the previous week, which Merckx had won by over five minutes. But Roger de Vlamic, in true de Vlamic style, after that race had been interviewed and he'd said, I'm definitely going to drop Merckx at Liège, Baston Liège. He didn't drop him, but he did beat him. Um, anyway, th- that was an interesting edition, 1970, of um, Liège, because Merckx actually had gone into that season... Um, pretty uncertain himself and other people were uncertain as well about the extent to which he was going to be able to recover from the terrible crash he'd had um, at uh, on the track in Blois the previous summer or the end of the previous summer and he said many times and he maintained throughout the rest of his career that he was never the same after that um, crash in Blois yet looking at his palmarès you wouldn't know that I mean he went on to have well, his career continued in very much the same vein um, after that 1969 crash in Bois. But I think um, he did change slightly after that, particularly in the Grand Tours. Um, the, the We didn't see quite the sort of audacious exploits, the, the, the long-distance raids um, that he had been able to pull off in the in the tour in particular in 69 we didn't really see that again from Merckx so um the crash probably did change him and you know maybe maybe that 1970 Liège when he was beaten by de Vlamic was an early sort of sign of that just a little corrections corner for me here um Eno of course won his first Giro in 1980 um so it was a tour that was disappointing but he did win the Giro so what about you, Lionel? Do you have a favourite Liège Baston Liège? Uh, well, sorry to disappoint. Not going to talk about too many of the the editions in the last thirty years, but I would say nineteen eighty seven is my favourite. Um, because firstly, Moreno Argentine's World Championship jersey and shorts combo is, uh, contrary to popular opinion, absolutely fantastic. It is a kind of stone washed version. The the bands themselves kind of fade towards the bottom. Um, controversial for the purists, I think. But uh, so you like you? That's your favourite edition of Liege Baston Liege because you liked what the winner was wearing. <laughs> Well, it has something to do with it. Certainly why it's lodged in my mind. When I saw, I think probably was the first time I saw Argentine's take on the rainbow jersey would have been in a cycling magazine that year. And I just, it just kind of blew my mind. It was it was amazing. And it's still, it's still lodged in my mind all these years later. If you haven't seen it and don't know what I'm talking about, just uh, Google Argentine rainbow jersey or something and I'm sure you'll, you'll find it. Um, He'd won Liège Baston Liège the two previous years, of course, and well, it was a real smash and grab by Argentine in the finish straight. Uh, the race finished in the town alongside the river that year, um, as it as it did for many years. Not the kind of uphill finish we're more familiar with from recent years. And Stephen Roach and Claude Croquillion were away together, and and basically they they had their pockets picked by Argentine, who closed in in the final couple of kilometres. Um, incredible number of cars in the finish straight between mm. the leading two and Argentine. So Argentine was kind of skulking in the shadow of the cars and, and was able to spring a real surprise. And um, it meant that Croquillion, the, the great Walloon, uh, well, he never won Liège Baston Liège. He won the Tour of Flanders, but he didn't win the, the classic in his home region. And Roach, who went on to have the incredible year where he won the Giro, the Tour de France and the World Championship. At the time, it felt like he'd let a a massive win slip through his fingers. And I I remember talking to him and he said that after the race, uh, he drove back to France uh, almost in a sort of 
in a in a sort of daze under 80 kilometers an hour on the auto route and he stopped halfway and rang home to his wife and said that under no circumstances was she to mention the race at all and not even ask how he'd got on uh, because he felt that he he should have won the race and uh caught napping but of course you know it's one of those uh, one of those races that goes down as um uh, a, a sort of famous as i say pickpocket moment argentine sprung them and uh, made it three in a row so that's my favorite but i think looking at them there's a period isn't there between about sort of 2003 and 2010 where uh, the role of honor perhaps uh, doesn't reflect brilliantly on uh, on cycling daniel got his head in his hands here but maybe it says something about the the culture of the sport during that time i mean tyler hamilton david rebelin alexander vinokurov alessandro valverde danilo de luca valverde and vinokurov again it's a it's a bit of a hall of infamy i want to say sh- infamy there we are <laughs> yes indeed um well that vinokurov win was controversial for other reasons as well um until a belgian court decided that they hadn't actually bought the race as had been alleged um that was what a year or so ago it we learned that was immortalized in a famous poster was it not or was that, <laughs> well, that, that, that was the um, other edition? That was his other yeah. Liège victory. Yeah, the, we had a we had a was it a signed it was. picture, a signed fo- a signed poster of Vinukarov uh, winning Liège Bastille Liège, um, which was given to us uh, in order to present as a gift by Prenda. Very wasn't much tongue in cheek. Obviously, gift. obviously stock that they couldn't quite shift, and uh, they sent us some poster, some signed poster of Vinukarov winning. We then had a raffle at a dinner that we organised um, where the guest speaker was one Christian Prudhomme, Prudhomme director himself. of the Tour de France. And, um, well, who would have believed it? But when the, the raffle was drawn, the winner of the signed Vinucroft poster was, was, was fixed. What was <laughs> Christian more fixed, Prudhomme. that edition of liege Baston liege or the <laughs> raffle in which Prudhomme uh, got the poster? He, did, he, he took it in very good spirits, didn't he? he did He saw the joke. So that was a nice moment. Um, yeah, I'm, I've been reading Sam Abt's uh, old book, Off to the Races, 25 Years of Cycling Journalism. And there's a chapter in there on Claude Crickelion, uh who you mentioned there, Lionel, went close several times, but never did win liege Bastogne liege He was a rider I liked a lot, maybe because he didn't win that much. Um, whereas Moreno Argentin was was a rider that I didn't warm to. He, he left me a bit cold, um, very a very ruthless kind of winner he was a sniper wasn't he? he he could um he could win these races without appearing to try and that you know <laughs> you're looking skeptical what what's that for v- what's virtual that eyebrow your virtual eyebrows are on the ceiling Richard. well i was going to just say about claude Criquilio. i mean they haven't you know when we talk about cycling in belgium we usually talk about flanders and philip gilbert is a um uh, a Wallonian who's obviously won Liège Bastogne Liège as well, but Claude Criquillion was the leading light from that area at that time. And you did a, a a little special last year on the area, didn't you? On on the a kind of esoteric sort of tour of mm. Wallonia. Yeah, I'd always uh, growing up watching cycling. I'd always thought of Liège Bastogne Liège as the best and kind of most prestigious of the classics. But I think in hindsight, that was because it was where the Tour de France riders tended to. Um, show themselves so there was a, there was much more of a sort of touchstone with Liège Baston Liège than there was for me with the Tour of Flanders and Paris Roubaix which which seemed to be you know slightly quirkier um, events but as I uh, you know as I kind of started covering cycling and going to Flanders to to see the Cobble Classic so often really kind of fell in love with that area and the, the culture of cycling in Flanders to the neglect of Wallonia and I felt that having gone and done the Lionel of Flanders a few years ago I ought to redress the balance and go and explore the Ardennes a little bit more and um, yeah I found it really uh, really interesting and uh, well we put the the special episode from last year onto the 2020 Friends of the Podcast feed so if you are a friend of the podcast you can go and listen to that now the the couple of things that stood out were the the recommendation um, of Patrick McGuinness's book which you recommended I read before I went to Wallonia, Richard, um, which really kind of 
uh, well, it influenced all of my thinking, really. It made me look at the region with with um, with fresh eyes. And the other thing, you mentioned Criquillion. There's a statue to Criquillion who uh, passed away in 2015, uh, midway up the Mur de Huy. And I noticed that the, the Tour of Flanders victory is not engraved on the statue. And I wondered whether there was some kind of... Uh, some kind of political reason for, for this. Obviously, there is a sense of rivalry between Flanders and Wallonia. And uh, we got our friend JP to ask the sculpture. And I, I need to follow up with JP to find out whether they've added the Tour of Flanders, engraved it onto that monument. But uh, I'll talk all about that in the special, the Lionel of the Ardennes, uh, which is and on the, the feed now. The pa- the Patrick McGuinness book you mentioned, Other People's Countries, A Journey into Memory, um, that'll be in the show notes for today. It's a really good book. He grew up in uh, that part of the world, and it's a, it's a great it's a great book. It really opens up uh, an area that I didn't know an awful lot about. We're always quite rude about Flesh Well On, aren't we? Um, just talking about uh, Cricetti on there, um, who did win Flesh Well On, didn't, didn't he? But, um, yeah, I'm not really missing Flesh Well On. Um, Liège, I thought, last year was really improved by... Um, not finishing on the um, where it had been finishing for the, the past couple of decades on that um, now very familiar rise in Anse. and um, but Flesh Wallon continues to finish on the Meur de Hoy I um, have taken to very rudely referring to it as the uphill cheese roll um, it's a bit like well, where does that take place the, the famous cheese roll in Gloucestershire where a round of cheese is dropped at the top of the hill and everyone piles down the hill I mean the Mur de Hoy is a bit like that, only the other way around. Or um, it's a bit like, I mean, Lionel, you said there um, when I think it's very common when people get into cycling to really love the Ardennes because it is a bit of an entry point. Um, the Tour de France riders sort of come out to play there, um, but I uh, find, particularly with Flesh Wallon, you get bored of it very quickly. It's a bit like a, a sort of Lana Del Rey album. You know, first time you think it's great, second time a bit less, third time you sort of think, well, have a day off, Lana. And you don't really want to listen to it again. <laughs> I feel a bit like that about Flesh Wallon. And, and I think having been there when uh, we, we went back after Flesh Wallon, uh, the day after the race, and we rode the moor, and then we had lunch in the town. And the town itself is lovely, and the climb itself is a, is a really nice challenge. It's really steep. It's a, it's a good thing to go and ride your bike on. And when you get to the top and there's none of the race um you know structure up there there's no finish line there's no barriers uh, you realize it's just a it's just a road a non a fairly nondescript road at the top of a of an unusually steep hill and, and on the left hand side there there's a sort of um an adventure park with huge uh, fiberglass dinosaurs that make dinosaur authentic dinosaur noises which were uh, well you'll hear a clip of that in in the special and it, it's all a bit incongruous and and i think that in a way that's slight, quite appropriate for um flesh alone because it is it's a slightly slightly unusual race these days in that we know the we know the the storyline before the race starts and 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 it is easy to be quite dismissive of that whereas liege baston liege i think at least has that kind of it at least has that history of being, you know, a very one of the very oldest events, and one that, when you look back at the Palmares, I mean, pretty much everyone who's everyone has won it at some point. Well, let's hear, shall we, from a rider who has ridden well the last couple of years in the Edge Bastogne. He was second two years ago to Bob Jungels, and he was fifth last year. A lot of people remember his. Um, he trialed a sort of new look with the one leg warmer. Um, in trying to get his leg warmers off, he could only get one off, and uh, that was quite um, quite interesting. Uh, Michael Woods, the Canadian rider from uh, EF Pro Cycling, um, he's had a well an eventful start to the year. He broke his leg in a crash at Paris Nice, that required an operation. Leon, he he, he then travelled back to Girona, um, where he and his wife have a, a young baby now. Another context to that is that many of you remember a couple of years ago at the Vuelta in 2018, he won a stage on a very steep hill in the Basque country. And he spoke afterwards about having lost um, a baby son, uh, Hunter, who was still born. A very sad story. And he spoke about it very movingly. Um, they, he and his wife, Ellie, have had a, a baby girl now. Um, so, um, you know, he's in lockdown in Spain and I suppose enjoying time with his baby while also recovering from his leg break and looking forward to returning to racing. Here is Michael Woods. 
Well, Mike, I mean, it's a, it must be a really strange time for you um, for all sorts of reasons. Um, can you take me back to Paris Nice? I mean, we we saw you crash, or we we saw the aftermath of crash. It was it was pretty obvious. It was a serious injury. Um, did you know immediately that it was a, a bad one? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just the pain, I, or uh, yeah, like normally, normally I, I can tell. Normally, like, like after you crash, my adrenaline. Your adrenaline's pumping so high that you can't really feel anything. Like you hit me with a hammer, and I'd be fine, mm. at least for that, that 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 brief period. But I I felt pain instantly, and so that's when I like any time it's bone, like almost most times it's been bone for me. Um, if I feel pain, I know it's really bad. Mm. And uh, yeah, like the way I hit uh, this rock. Uh, I just felt the crack in my femur when I hit it, and I knew, oh, this is bad. And then I looked at my leg, and I lifted the leg, and like the my, lifted my quad, and the upper portion of the quad came up, but the bottom portion didn't. Hmm. And, and when that happened, I like I freaked out. Normally, I'm pretty calm, but I I, I started yelling. Like I was like, no. Yeah. So the, there's just a... because I was like it was it was both pain that like caused that, but also just instantly thinking of uh the olympics coming up the world championships the tour all those things i'd really kind of targeted this season i realized we're probably going to be uh, uh compromised mm. and so that, that that moment after was uh yeah it was painful so then there was a transfer to hospital nearby yeah uh the, the, yeah i got in the got in the ambulance and went to lyon uh and from there, it went from me being worried about the rest of the season to just kind of starting to realize the significance of coronavirus. I, I was already feeling it prior to the crash, and I think it actually affected. It's probably one of the reasons why I crashed. I, I just wasn't a hundred percent when I went into the race. I was uh, so focused on like no, like to have success in the world tour, you have to be a hundred percent focused. And I think there were a couple of percentage points lacking in that focus. Uh, because of just everything that was going on in the world. And every day that we raced f- further into the race, it was harder to ignore. Mm. Andreas Clear, my director, had asked me, had asked everybody at the start of the race to like devote themselves to the race when they were in it. They could think about other things outside of the race, but really devote themselves to the race. And that was really good advice. But uh, I, 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 I became distracted and, and for sure it was the reason why I crashed. And yeah, going into that hospital in the own, it was so bizarre. Just everyone wearing masks, eerily quiet, um, and just hoping my parents could get there in time to get me out of France before the border, border between France and Spain closed. Yeah, because that that was a concern. I mean, you've you've got a small baby as well, and I guess at the back of your mind must have been the fear, even during the race, of maybe being stuck in France in a hotel in France for two weeks. Yeah, at, at minimum, it was. Yeah, uh, not just that. It was like it was a really weird, situ- unique and weird situation for me. I'm not a resident of Spain. I'm a resident of Andorra, but we're in Girona over the court. We're always, we're always in Girona over the winter, as the the weather in up in Andorra is not great. And uh, uh, at that time, I mean, and uh, yeah, like my wife and my my baby girl were in Girona, uh, and my parents came to pick me up, but if the border closed, we wouldn't be allowed back into Spain because we were residents there. Mm. And then I couldn't go up to Andorra because my parents, uh, couldn't, wouldn't be able to get in. And, uh, even if I went up to Andorra, we had the family, I had the car, we had the family car. So my, my wife and my daughter wouldn't be able to join me in Andorra. So we were like really panicked that we would, wouldn't be able to see each other for a while. And, uh, we, we, we staged a, an escape early in the morning against some of the doctor's wishes just to get get back to, to Spain. How, how long was that? How long were you in hospital then? Uh, I had surgery at... Uh, I, I had surgery right away after the crash and was up at around 9 o'clock on Thursday night uh, and was able to get out of the hospital by Saturday morning. Wow. And, and I mean, I, I, you know, a bad enough injury to just... Um, to to sort of recover from and and begin rehabilitation without everything else going on, how how has how has that been? I mean, how how has the injury healed? Uh, it's it's actually coming along quite well. Um, it's kind of been one of the bright spots of 
of the injury of the the whole lockdown uh just having something to focus on having a recovery to focus on um it's been kind of nice to have have that to kind of ske- schedule my days around uh, i've been really lucky i've got had a have a great sponsor back in canada called v210 and they've uh, they've been helping me out with a swan year and uh, a physiotherapist coming by almost every day uh, to help out or just get me rehabilitated and help uh, my wife with, with just getting groceries and because she's really dealing with two useless people at the moment. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's just been, uh, it's been, it has been good like having this kind of goal to aim towards. So you, you, uh, you've been able to get some hands on sort of uh, support rather than just remote kind of rehab support. Yeah, exactly. Um, our, my doctor wrote me a, a, a prescription a note for physiotherapy and, and uh, massage therapy. And so we've been lucky enough to have those practitioners come by and it really helps break up the day. And uh, yeah, again, helps me with that focus of just kind of not getting too distracted by what's going on in the rest of the world and, and kind of plugging away. And the other advantage of it too is it's really forced me to spend time with Max and my daughter and sit around and just enjoy being around her and and in many ways, this is like the injuries have actually been good. Like, uh, I, I've been running it hot for, for, I don't know, two or three years now, just in terms of weight and in terms of fitness. And, uh, even in the off season, I'd go back to Canada and just be on all, all the time doing events and, uh, still riding my bike quite a bit. And, uh, over this past, these past six weeks, I've gone fat. I've cut the testosterone way back up just cause, <laughs> cause I'm sitting around, not, not co- chronically fatigued. Uh, my desire and my uh, ambitions are coming up and energy levels are coming up and it's actually been been kind of nice it was almost good to get that that hit, hit the factory reset button so you feel kind of refreshed and uh, energized almost by this yeah yeah i wish i wish i hadn't broke my femur mm. uh but uh yeah uh, i mean definitely feeling a bit uh my from a body perspective feeling uh feeling new and uh, obviously when i get back on the bike i'm going to be going pretty slow for the first two months but i don't think i don't foresee uh we're not gonna be racing for another four months at least and that gives me ample time to to really uh ramp up the training and what what, what stage are you at in your rehab i mean when will you be on the on the bike again well i started riding two weeks after the injury just kind of turning over the legs uh pedaling uh really easily just with 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 uh like trainers on not with uh bike shoes uh but now uh i'm four weeks of riding now uh just on the trainer and i'm starting to push a bit more uh on thursday i'm going to be able to start standing my leg feels normal almost i'm really tempted to start putting weight weight on it now but uh, i'm going to listen to the doctors and stay on the crutches for another three four more days and no, then uh, no after, after sorry, oh, sorry guys no picking up the baby just yet. Uh, I can pick up the baby, but not walk around with her, which mm. is which is terrible because she likes being uh, <laughs> she likes being carried. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, of course, you can't go out on the bike at the moment, anyway. So it's uh, you know, I'm, I, you know, the trainer would have been your friend the last few weeks, anyway. I guess. Yeah, it's regardless, been cathartic, actually, yeah. just sweating, sweating on it. And your your wife's been uh, been on the trainer quite a lot. I I understand. I think. The, the future of the res- of the sports revealed itself already with uh, Zwift. Yeah. Um, uh, Ellie is not an avid cyclist. She rides maybe once a month max. And since this uh, uh, quarantine, she's been going on Zwift, you know, almost every day. Mm. She's done uh, she's done a ramp test. I think an FTP ramp test. She's doing intervals, uh, and she's in really enjoying it. So, like watching that, you start realizing, okay, there's, there's, this is a real access point. To even like now, Ellie understands watts and power and intervals and in, in cycling, and that's a major access point to, to the sport. Um, and yeah, I can just see it being the future of the sport. In a lot that's ways. interesting. Yeah, the the measurability of of progress for somebody new to it must be, must be quite exciting. Totally. Yeah. And to be to have it be relatable and fun, mm. um, like I I'm not I'm not keen for the the sport to be as like to be all online. Uh, I I wouldn't have I'd be I'd be a worse rider if it was on everything was on Zwift, especially under the current uh, uh, programming where you can't steer or, or employ tactics as much. Uh, but uh, 
it's hard to deny that this is going to be like it is going to be the future of the sport. Mm. And uh, Mike, this week we're we're looking back on or remembering Liège Bastogne Liège. I mean, it's it's a race that must have a quite a special place in your heart. The last couple of years you've ridden very well there you were second a couple of years ago and i guess that was a really important result for you yeah liege is going to be my 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 favorite race uh i like it the most i like it because it's just such a a challenging uh it's a race of attrition um it's just a hard race uh mentally physically everything um and it's at an interesting point in the calendar it's a special like it's it's one of the most special monuments and yeah i just i like all the aspects of it so for it to not be happening is really really weird mm. um but uh yeah hopefully i can i can be doing it again next year or maybe even in the fall what did you um what do you recall of, of last year's race it famously of course you you the um, yeah the, the one leg warmer was the the sort of the, <laughs> the fashion talking point of the day but um, it was a, it was a pretty. I mean that that was a sort of symptomatic of how frantic it was, wasn't it? Um, the the race last year. Crosswinds, terrible weather. I think my Garmin read four degrees at one point. Uh, I did a full kit change at one point. I even took my undershirt off. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, I, I I don't. I personally dressed super well. I felt like and was feeling really good for the final. And when uh, I believe it was Gary attacked. I was in the middle of taking off my leg warmers and one was still on and it was too late. Uh, if I, if I spent time taking off the next leg warmer, I would have not been in the race anymore. So I, I just realized I was going to have to deal with getting made fun of for the, probably the rest of my career <laughs> and race with this one, one leg warmer. But I figured it'd be, if I won Liège, I'd, I'd, I'd take all the, all the, all the comments and the chirps and the, the criticisms quite easily with a, a victory uh that would be a but, great uh, a great picture wouldn't it crossing the line arms aloft one leg warmer on exactly but uh Fuglesang was on a day uh i attacked on Rocher Foucault, instigated it really felt like i had a shot at winning and uh we came to right after russia calm really flattens out and then you take a right and it kind of builds up gradually again Fuglesang took over the pace and both formal and i uh, were just left in his dust. Uh, like he was, he was on a day. Uh, mm. I, I was put out some of the biggest numbers of my, of my life on that last section of the climb and, uh, just couldn't hold on. He was, he was, he was a motor. Uh, yeah. And I faded and ended up getting caught by the group and came fifth, but, uh, it was a, it was a cool race. I actually thought, felt like the new course was, uh, was, was nice because it just finished in, in Liege proper and not near a car floor. Yeah. Um, I mean, we've got this, this rescheduled calendar now for late in the year. Nobody knows, you know, how, what the situation is going to be like then, but for you, and also, you know, given that you're, you're, you're fighting back to fitness after your crash, I mean, what, what was it like mentally, psychologically to, to think that there's a possibility that racing might resume then and that you might, you know, you might be able to be part of it? Well, first I think I was really excited. I was almost excited for the calendar to be, delayed so significantly um i was excited about the olympics going to 2021 um just for selfish reasons because yeah like it just gave me more time to get back and be at 100 percent um i'm confident i'll get back to 100 percent but uh giving me just more of a runway i've ruined one athletic career already in my life uh in running and I, i rushed back too fast and so i really wanted to make sure i was patient with this comeback but uh now after uh, a couple more weeks of thinking on the delays in the schedules and having the city schedules revealed, you start kind of feeling a bit of anxiety about the sport in general and wondering if it, even though they've been delayed, will they happen? Um, personally, I, I like, I, I want them to happen obviously, but, uh, I think, I think they need to happen just to, for the sake of the sport, uh, in order to, you know, that I think this, this sport's in a really bad, the sport's in a really bad state at the moment. It's really, uh, uh teetering on a, uh, it, it's, 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 it's in some ways on the brink and a lot. And so, um, it needs some good news and it needs something like the tour and the monuments to still go on for it to really, uh, have to continue. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, uh, the desire to sort of cram as many races as possible into these three months, it, it tells us a lot about, 
uh, perhaps how how precarious it is, and, and especially with with one or two teams, or maybe more than one yeah. or two teams. Precarious, and also how like frustrating. It's really frustrating for me uh, um, thinking about the UCI, thinking about the CPA, thinking about um, the uh, the race organizers, and how how uh, fragile they've made this sport how dependent they've made it on certain sponsors, how cutthroat they've made it. Um, and in many ways, they've kind of, they've created this problem. Like it's not, obviously coronavirus is, is what set this problem off, but uh, it's just magnified what was wrong with the sport. And uh, like ultimately they're, they're responsible for it. Mm. Um, and I think also, you know, like I wish we had some people that were competent, like truly competent and uh, not stuck in tradition at the helm of this uh, sport at the moment. Like, and I'm talking from a UCI perspective, ASO perspective, um, you know, even within the riders union, the CPA, I wish we had people that were like at the heads of those, those organizations that, that uh, were, more forward thinking and recognize that this is a real opportunity to make dramatic change to the sport that's necessary. Mm. What, what would they be? What would the, what would those changes be at the moment? I think a, a consolidation of the calendar. Uh, I think um, telling a more compelling narrative, like having more so, stories throughout the season. Yeah. It's so weird that we have, like the tour as the biggest event yet the world championships happens uh, well after that. And then you have the Italian classics that fall after the world championships, like to a, a, a spectator. It's, it's so, it's so even to the layman, like, like, and I, I am, I, I was one, like I had no idea about the sport when I first entered it. I had no clue how to understand it. And I had no clue who was the best rider in the world and how to quantify that or to understand like what, what races are important, what aren't important. This is an opportunity to really do a cleanse of the schedule and, and reschedule things so that it can tell that compelling narrative and like have a proper storyline. Shoot, uh, shoot at l'arrière du peloton, cycling podcast, team car, the back of the pack, please. That's the voice of Sam Piquet interrupting us to remind me to tell you that this week's episode is sponsored by the Friends of the Cycling Podcast. The Cycling Podcast, as many of you will know, is an independent media company. There is no multinational conglomerate lurking in the shadows, no Rupert Murdoch, no Oleg Tinkoff, and so we rely entirely on the support of our sponsors and listeners. We're very lucky. Iwaka and Science and Sport are committed sponsors, and we are extremely grateful to them. If you are a friend of the podcast, you are also a very important sponsor, and we want to say a big thank you. You help us produce this regular weekly show, the upcoming daily coverage of our Giro, Mitch Docker's fortnightly Life in the Peloton, and also our monthly shows, the Cycling Podcast Femina, Explore and Service Course. If you're a friend of the podcast, you also get exclusive friend specials, in-depth episodes including our audio diaries from the Grand Tours, Lionel's meeting with Yanni Brykovic, and our most recent special on the Dutch phenomenon, Matthew van der Poel. There are also some older shows in the current feed, so if you sign up now, you will get our look back on arguably the best team of this century, HTC High Road, Matt Heyman reliving his 2016 Paris-Roubaix win, meeting Jean Bobby, an interview with the 1950s star, and new for this weekend, the Lionel of the Ardennes, Lionel's excursion last year along Belgian cycling's less well-travelled road. Friends of the podcast can also now access old episodes of Kilometre Zero from the Grand Tours. Any episodes from 2018 or before are on a new Kilometre Zero feed available only to friends of the podcast. To support the Cycling Podcast by becoming a friend, go to thecyclingpodcast.com forward slash subscribe. It's £15 for a year's membership, but there are options to pay a little extra, and if you do, you'll get a signed copy of our latest book, The Grand Tour Diaries, delivered to your door. Before we carry on with this week's episode, let's hear a short extract from the most recent special, Van der Poel. I pressed the buzzer, drove into the driveway, 
rang the bell and entered the Vanderpool family home, meeting Adri's other son, David, also a professional with Alps and Phoenix, on my way in. Then I was shown into the large open plan living area while Adri disappeared to make coffee. Then he and his wife, Corinne, that's Raymond Pulador's daughter, appeared, and there was a brief conversation with them about a book that, for obvious reasons, had caught my eye on their bookshelves. Adri explained that he didn't read any books, so it must be one of his wife's. The book was Retour en Ecosse, the French translation of a romantic novel by Rosamund Pilcher. Hello there. Retour en, en Ecosse. I don't know it. Retour en Ecosse. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. That's mine. Hmm. Yeah. I'm from ah, Scotland. Scottish. Yeah. In fact, um, yeah, they speak well the uh, one I read. Eh? Yeah. The Nesso. The in Amelie, Stabil, the Kikomir, the Kiesef, the Prenny. And then what's the other one? David Frauen. In fact, I, I did a race once that you were riding in Glasgow. Do you remember? You won it in 1992. Right. Uh, it was, I think, just before the Kellogg's Tour of Britain. So there was a. Yeah, 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 uh, no, Criterium. A, Criterium. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was riding that. Yeah. Um, I remember. I remember you winning it. I think you were writing for Tulip Computers at the time. Yeah, I was. I was. I think I was. When I was remembering well, I was um, preparing the sprint for another guy in in our team. Maybe. So I turned the last yeah. corner. I turned first, yeah. and the second one he crashed. Right, right. So it wasn't Alan Piper wasn't writing that year, was he? Yeah, or maybe. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I was way back, so I wouldn't have seen that. <laughs> Hey guys, this is Larry Warbass. You're listening to Lockdown with Larry. <coughs> Sitting here uh, mid six hour ride. Uh, got a training partner today, Brayden Voss, a uh, <coughs> talented junior rider from uh, my area in northern Michigan, not Texas. Um, and yeah, we're out here doing a big one. So, trying to do <coughs> a sort of simulated uh, classic ride today so I thought try to do the same uh, time and uh, kilojoules for those who know what those are uh, <clears throat> as like a big classic um, but in a training ride so good to have some company uh, hopefully uh, it's going going well. well we'll see see what Brandon has to say hey, what's up guys uh it's nice to have a wheel to hold on to. <laughs> it's got me spinning out of the junior gears. Um, this will be the longest ride I've ever done and <laughs> definitely my highest average speed for 100 miles. <laughs> Turned out to be a beautiful day and happy to have some company as well. Yeah, <clears throat> we're lucky here. Today it's sunny uh, and it is probably the high is going to be 12 or 13 degrees celsius so uh for us that's uh that's a really really nice day right now so yeah good day to do a big one and uh hopefully it goes well <clears throat> we'll keep you updated hey guys so <clears throat> it's evening not evening time now uh it's april 18th just finished our uh, giant classic classic ride today uh so the idea was to try to simulate a classic you know i've been doing some pretty big rides the last weeks and uh <clears throat> like once per week and you know thought like oh you know i was doing some big days and i was thinking how far i was off from a classic and so i went and looked at sort of the stats from um the classics i've done the last few years like liege and amstel Lombardia and stuff, and uh, yeah, I saw I wasn't so far off in terms of like kilojoules, and uh, uh, I would say that's like you know a pretty good measure, which is for those who don't know, you know, the a unit of work. Um, so it's like your output. So uh, roughly equates like one point one to a calorie. Um, so yeah, it's like a really hard. A lot of hard races will be around 4,000 kilojoules. 5,000 is a pretty, very big day. And a lot of classics are up around 6,000. So, um, 
so yeah, kind of, I asked my coach and, uh, he put down a ride and luckily got some company, a uh, local junior who <clears throat> is very good. He races for the hot tubes junior team. Uh, yeah, lives around here and, you know, he's also back in town at the moment, uh, because the whole situation we're in. <clears throat> so we went for a really good solid ride. Um, and just the two of us, and yeah, it was, it was sweet, uh, he was really strong, really impressive, able to keep up pretty much the whole time, and, uh, yeah, uh, we did 6,400 kilojoules for the data geeks, uh, with, yeah, it was about, which was exactly the same as I did in Liège last year, and more than in some of the years past, um, and yeah, it's more than Lombardia or more than Amstel. So, uh, and I end up with, I would say all the stats worked out pretty similar, uh, similar to a classic. So it was kind of cool to do that, uh, especially on the day that Amstel's normally held. So nice day out. Glad to get a good, good solid day. And, uh, yeah, tomorrow is the last day of training before a little, uh, easy week because, uh, yeah, I've been training pretty hard out here now. So came home and, uh, <clears throat> opened up cycling news to see, uh, a funny article about Rowan Dennis, which I'm sure everyone will be talking about because he violated, uh, <clears throat> lockdown rules in Spain or something and then deleted his social media. And, you know, um, I'm sure he's going to get, a lot of heat for it and whatever. Uh, and I know he's quite a controversial character, but, uh, you know, I know like there was a lot of talk about what he did in the tour last year and stuff like that. But I actually have to say that I, I have some respect for what he did in the tour last year because he stood up for himself in a way that a lot of other guys, uh, would not or have not, or don't really have the ability to, and, you know, since he's quite a big rider, he does have the ability to do that, and, you know, I thought it's kind of cool to see someone actually standing up for themselves um, <clears throat> in what I think is actually a pretty important issue, even though many people won't agree with that, um, but that's a totally another story <laughs> from what today, today happened. Um, obviously, it's probably not the brightest thing to post on social media uh if you're breaking your lockdown rules wherever you are um it's also probably just not a good idea to break the rules in the first place uh but definitely wouldn't be publicizing it but you know i know again he's gonna get a ton of heat for this um which is maybe more deserved than than the last one but uh i do kind of find it funny that people you know, go off on him as much as they do when so many of those people are the same ones who uh, criticize other riders for, uh, you know, not being open enough. And so, you know, it's it's kind of funny because it's like people are, you know, mad if if guys aren't open enough and then they're mad if they are as open as Rowan is. Uh, so... I mean, you know, maybe that's a contentious topic, whatever, but, uh, you know, I think, uh, that is the problem with social media is it's a very curated view of life. And sometimes it's refreshing to see <laughs> when people are real and, uh, you know, everyone loses their shit. So I guess, uh, I mean, in the end, it looked like he went for a drive by himself. So I don't think you're really hurting anyone, but you know, whatever. Uh, so just thought I'd send a quick note on that. Uh, but yeah, this week has, uh, been a good one. <clears throat> Some other first, I did my first Zwift race this week and, uh, ended up fourth. So I was pretty happy with that. It was a criterion. I didn't really know what to expect, but, uh, I read an article like a couple days before on how, uh, you know, this, I don't know, big Zwift racer in the U.S. does his stuff. And so I took some tips from that, um, set up a bunch of fans to cool myself down, 
and uh yeah, it was fun it was interesting it was actually really hard uh and i think it's a really good way to get a super good workout in especially in a way that i wouldn't have been able to do on my own i wouldn't have been able to push myself that hard on just a normal training ride so to have the little bit of that motivation uh and the game effect uh is kind of cool and yeah so i was just like I was suffering so hard that after a few minutes, I looked down and my handlebars were actually sideways on my trainer. I didn't even know. I was just like uh, suffering and watching the the TV screen. So uh, it was fun. Did it with a lot of my teammates and uh, it was a good day out. So kind of got me excited to maybe do it again. Maybe try to integrate it like once a week or something to get a little bit of intensity in the legs uh, in the next couple weeks since we obviously won't have racing for a long time. And I, it's something I could see myself doing a little bit of in the future. Um, I race this uh, digital Swiss 5 this next week. I do the third stage, which is sort of like the queen stage. Um, <clears throat> so that'll be tough and interesting. Uh, but, uh, yeah, there's definitely going to be some hitters in that one. So don't expect to be getting fourth place uh in in that but we'll see uh so so yeah uh that is a bit of news from the warbass household and i will keep you updated ciao the cycling podcast is supported by science in sport science in sport fueled by science Thank you very much to Science and Sport for their support of the cycling podcast. And you can get 25% off all your Science and Sport products at scienceandsport.com with the code SISCP25. And among the Science and Sport products you may buy are those from a new performance nitrate range which has been launched this week and which has been formulated to deliver effective doses of dietary nitrates to support loading, pre-exercise, and intra-exercise usage. The key performance benefit is that nitrates improve muscle efficiency by reducing the oxygen cost of exercise and maximising endurance performance, enabling athletes to go harder for longer. The SIS performance nitrate range includes gels, bars, powders and shots, and they use rhubarb juice concentrate and amaranthus leaf extract as unique sources of nitrates, providing a superior taste and delivering a higher nitrate dose than anything else on the market. For more information on the science and sport performance nitrate range go to scienceandsport.com well we heard there from larry warbass with his latest dispatch from uh he is in michigan not in texas in michigan is he? where he lives in the in the in the frozen midwest is that in texas no daniel i mean have you do you know america at all Can yes you find it on a yes. map yeah but uh, yeah um but i i sort of imagine Larry on his ranch out there, um, <laughs> you know, with his la- with his lasso, with his ten gallon hat on. Um, yeah. yeah, well, Larry, um, yeah, the stars and stripes fluttering in the in the yard. Um, anyway, Larry, I did I did ask him about his latest dispatch because uh, he talks in there about going riding with a, a local rider, and you know that that's not allowed in in some parts of the world, and it's it's okay in others. Uh, I, I asked him what the rules were where he is, and he said the guidelines are quite vague. This is what he said in the message. Um, we're allowed to exercise outside. It's just use your best judgment and don't do anything in large groups. Pretty much use common sense and don't be stupid. So personally, I will ride alone or with one other person while keeping some distance. Each day I get passed by numerous police, and what we're doing has never been a problem for them. So clearly we're also being sensible in their eyes. Um so that if some of you are wondering about him going out for a long ride with another rider, that's what he said to that. Um, and, you know, different parts of the world have said are doing it um, slightly differently. And uh, people are re- responding differently. Have you got, this is our sort of coronavirus section of the podcast, I suppose. We've compartmentalized it. Have you got a, a kind of roundup Lionel of, of the latest Well, there has been a bit of news over the last week, I suppose. Yeah, there has. I've got a couple of corrections, first of all. Um, Daniel, a couple of weeks ago, you talked about um, Jeff Brackevelt and his nickname for his wife being Muska. 
Mushka. Mushka. Yeah. Uh, Eve from Flanders writes in to say that Mushka is a little bird, not a little mouse. Oh, there we yeah. are. Bad information from our Belgian wow. friends. Uh, I'm going to out them. I'm going to call them out. Jan Peter de Vliga. Oh. And it might even be Hugo Corbett <laughs> actually told me that it was little oh, mouse. Well. Um, well, there we are. And uh, also, last week I asked about the longest running sponsorship of a, of a race. I meant title sponsorship of a race like, like Amstel Gold Race or Omloop Het Newsblad. And, uh, well, in a ring, first of all, mentioned the Paris Camembert Le Petit uh, Semi Classic, which is sponsored by the Cheese and has been since 1943. The race started in 1934 and it became Paris Camembert in 1936. I, I didn't, I wasn't specific enough in um, what I was saying. I, I did mean World Tour or, or equivalent races, but. Uh, well, I'm happy to set the record straight on that. On uh, coronavirus-related cycling news, uh, South African rider Willie Smith rode 1,000 kilometres on Zwift. Other platforms are available. That's 37 hours in the saddle. He rides for the Burgos BH team at the moment after a couple of years with Katusha. But 1,000 kilometres, um, that is a serious amount of Zwifting, isn't it? Yeah, that's phenomenal. Um I mean, it 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 beggars belief. Yeah, well, frankly, uh, Geraint Thomas raised more than three hundred and sixty thousand pounds and counting for the NHS with his back-to-back twelve-hour shifts. He did three of those rides, didn't he, Richard? And you spoke to him on the phone. Yeah, we'll hear from him. Uh, I spoke to him while he was actually putting out about two hundred and twenty watts, which was quite impressive. I thought. Um, yeah, we'll hear from him a bit later on. Willie Smith, he, if you're interested in him, we've got a, quite a long interview with him in one of our Vuelta episodes from last year. Again, details will be in the show notes, but he's he had a very interesting uh, background and quite a tough upbringing. Um, as you say, rode for Good golfer. Good golfer. Good golfer, apparently. I didn't know that when I spoke to him, but yeah, details of where to find that interview with him in the Best. episode notes. Best golfer ever to ride a Grand Tour. Really? Is yes. that official? That's, um, yes, that's confirmed well, by listen the out for, Daniel Free Borders. Yeah, statistics. listen out for a corrections corner on <laughs> yeah. that in two weeks. Yeah, he, 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 he finished. I don't think it's even, it won't even be close. finished the Grand Tour 14 minutes under par. Um, <laughs> Molly Weaver's Dirty Weaver ride 130 kilometres round her I assume parents back garden Yeah, uh, 1,000 laps raising £12,600 for Women's Aid the Women's Aid Federation of England uh, churned up the lawn a bit as well because it was a bit bit damp on Saturday but uh, again quite quite an effort that uh, Chris I, Borden, um, I, sorry. I, I, donate, I donated £30 to that um uh, right, and, and accidentally click the anonymous uh, button. Is it, <laughs> is it bad to <laughs> feel disappointed about that? <laughs> oh my god! Oh, Come Rich, on, Richard oh, would shit. like it to be known. He's really showing his true colours. <laughs> Have donated. you seen that episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm where Larry David has? <laughs> he's donated money for a wing of the hospital to be built, and it's a Larry David wing. And then there's there's another wing that's new as well that that is is um, just says donated by anonymous, <laughs> but the anonymous donor gets an awful lot more kudos than Larry David for having his name on it, and everybody knows the anonymous donor is is Ted Danson, and so <laughs> it's just a brilliant. Anyway, we'll probably take this out of the podcast. Well, no, I think we should leave it in. Well done for donating thirty pounds, Richard. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Chris Boardman has been replacing bikes that NHS workers have been having stolen. I mean, this is this is kind of the best and worst of human nature in one go, really, isn't it? The the, the fact that people's bikes are being stolen when Richard they're... Richard versus it, it'd be better if Boardman was doing <laughs> yeah. anonymously, obviously. <laughs> There's quite a bit of racing going on on digital platforms. The Digital Swiss starts tomorrow as we speak on Wednesday. It's a five-day stage race. Um, 46 kilometres is the longest distance, but they range between about 25 kilometres and, and the 46 kilometres. On the start line, Roman Bardet, uh, Remco Evenepoel, uh, Sam Bennett, Julian Alaphilippe, Bob Jungles, Greg Van Avermaet, Primoz Roglic, Rowan Dennis... Michael Matthews, Vincenzo Nibali, Adam Yates, Esteban Chavez, Dan Martin, Max Schachman. Uh, this is on the Ruvi platform, and I believe you'll be able to watch this on uh, the BBC Red Button. Daniel, do I you thought, know more? I thought, Ro- I thought Rowan Dennis had cancelled himself. 
<laughs> come to that in a minute. <laughs> I, um, I, I I was speaking to the Velon chief Graham Bartlett just this morning, Lionel, about this. Um, it is it's not exactly a Tour de Suisse. There might there might yet be a Tour de Suisse digital version on the dates when the Tour de Suisse was going to take place, but. Um, they are using some of the routes or parts of the routes that were going to be in the Tour de Suisse. So, um, yeah, interesting initiative. Again, put together very, uh, very quickly, and um, and all credit to you know everyone involved for doing that. And um, yeah, it should be interesting. A good TV coverage. Um, BBC, you mentioned, it's on ZDF in Germany. It's on a lot of other major networks. Flow bikes, I think in North America or in Canada. So um, yeah, be be um, following that with interest. Uh, Mitch Docker, the host of Life in the Peloton, which is uh, his podcast, which is on our platform, of course, he's taking part as well. And uh, I gather this morning, we're speaking on Tuesday, they were having a kind of a, a recce of the course, checking that it's um, checking that all the, the, the computers are plugged in. Uh, I'm out of my depth here. I'm shrugging. You can't see me shrugging. Um, but we'll, we'll catch up. I'll catch up with Mitch for his episode this week. And uh, we'll find out uh, just what's in store with the digital Swiss race. Um, Victor Campanets was going to do some actual real cycling. He was planning to have an assault on the hour record in London last week. Uh, this is quite a sort of sit up and take notice type story because, um, well, l- the logistics of that would have been significant. And well, the reason they didn't do it was because of the fear of a of a sort of public backlash against the idea of doing it I, I suppose it wouldn't have would have made social distancing dif- difficult in some ways although of course riding a an hour record you're you're just on your own on the track but there'd have to be other people involved in order for it to be ratified and so on and I would have thought everyone's got a bit more on their plates at the moment um don't know whether I think, you know any more about well that. no but when I saw I've seen quite a debate raging about this and I can sort of see both sides of it and I don't think any sport really wants to break ranks and be the first to resume i suppose because they will cop a bit of flack i imagine but i've it did ring a few bells with the rafael nadal um proposal as well to hold tennis uh, matches in at his center in majorca where you could have quite a controlled environment i guess you could get some of the top players together test them obviously not have a, a crowd um, but you could get some kind of resumption of top level sport in those types of places. And it did make me think that, you know, when it, it is approved, and I'm sure we will see it in the next m- couple of months, um, you know, velodromes could be a way back for bike racing. Um, this will not meet with Daniel's approval. Daniel wants to say something, I can tell. <laughs> well, no, um, th- there was some other. Our record news, I don't know if you chaps um, saw that yesterday, but the Dutch rider, the retired Dutch rider, 35 years old, Kai Raus, um, used to ride for Ravenbank among other teams. Um, his career was well badly affected by a, a bad accident in 2007. He was in a coma for um, 11 days. But he has declared that he would like to go after Victor Campanets' existing hour record next year, in April next year. You're right, Rich. Velodromes could be the the way that cycling returns, um, not with spectators, of course. But uh, what about uh, an indoor Grand Tour on the track? I mean, I put the, it to Mike Woods that velo, you know, velodromes could be a way back. He wasn't he wasn't hugely enthused by that. But the thirty close, the, the Ghent thirty six day <laughs> closed circuit races as well. Perhaps you know. I mean, we could just have flesh alone uh, you know but um world championship style races closed circuit you know and i think one day races rather than stage races mm. are more realistic but uh, you know there are lots of lots of things to consider there yeah um you mentioned uh, rowan dennis well he's he's had a difficult uh, few days he posted on instagram uh, last week, day 34, cracked and left the house. COVID-19 can suck my ass and so can quarantine. And then there was a backlash against that and he's deleted his social media. Uh, meanwhile, Philippe Gilbert was fined for riding outdoors in Monaco and got a hundred euro fine. He wanted to do laps of a, an 11 kilometer circuit, apparently. But I, I do think that particularly with Rowan Dennis, uh, you know, I do have a lot of sympathy for people 
you know, who are finding it very hard to be cooped up. And when you compare what their lives were like before all of this, you know, they've gone from one extreme to another. You know, the rest of us, I work from home in an office. I'm, I'm kind of doing an extension of what I normally do any, anyway. But if you're used to going out riding three, four, five hours a day outdoors, the, the scenery changing and, and the, the fresh air, being cooped up must be taking a real strain on people. And, and I thought that the, the backlash was a bit unfortunate. I mean, you know, everyone's a everyone's entitled to inevitable to crack don't, at don't, some point. I, I no? mean, well, don't don't post it on social media then. I'm not condoning at all um, what he did because the rules in Spain where he was are very, very clear. But Mike Woods made the point that, you know, the, the rules are... Well, they're, they're, they're harsher in Spain than anywhere else, pretty much, although Italy's got tighter, hasn't it, the last the last couple of weeks. Um, it is tough, and I think I got a sense of that speaking to Jack Haig last week as well. <clears throat> there are some riders who uh, will be coping better, and actually I thought Rowan Dennis, being a time trialist and probably not minding quite so much the, the sort of training that, that they'll be doing now, um, might fare better, but for a lot of riders, obviously being outdoors and uh, having that freedom that you get from riding a bike um, will be a, a big thing that they're missing. And well, f- not just bike riders, but everybody, um, everybody's mental health will be um, under a lot of strain with these constraints that we're all living under now. Just briefly away from the coronavirus uh, related stories, the UCI Ethics Commission has found that the health mate Cycle Live team manager Patrick Van Hansen is guilty of violating the UCI's code of ethics. Uh, this case has been going on over a year and now it's over to the disciplinary commission to decide uh, what the sanctions will be. This stems from complaints by several riders about Van Hansen's behaviour and relates to Appendix 1 of the UCI's Code of Ethics, which deals with protecting riders' physical and mental health, uh, sexual harassment and abuse. And, uh, well, Richard, you talked about this in a recent episode of the cycling podcast Feminine, didn't you? Yeah, we've been covering the the story a little bit in the cycling podcast Femina, and uh, we will probably be covering it again um, because we've got another episode coming out next week actually for the cycling podcast Femina originally to take in uh, the Ardennes races obviously not now the case but the episode will still come out next week it'll look at um, mainly at Annemiek van Vluten uh, with an interview with her and her coach but we will cover some of this news as well and finally I'm back to the coronavirus story and probably the most significant thing that's happened in the last week or so we did mention it briefly in last week's episode uh, that the tour de france is planning to hold the race starting on august the 29th Um, dave browsford has said that team ineos would pull out of the tour if it's not safe but i think it goes without saying that the event won't go ahead unless it is deemed safe by uh, the french authorities um it it does kind of set the the tone for how the resumption will go i mean it seemed to me to be more about establishing a precedent that the tour de france will take precedence when it comes to resuming whenever that may be rather than a kind of you know this is a set in stone resumption date i don't know how yeah you although the, there will be uh, obviously races and the, i think the criterium du dauphine will be one of the the races leading up to that so the riders aren't just plunged straight into a grand tour um i was taken aback a little bit um by some of the reaction to this announcement um, and some of the anger directed at ASO for having the audacity almost to uh, come up with a, a plan, you know, for their for their race. Um, uh, and it's almost as if people think that this is a decision that's motivated by uh, considerations over money rather than health. And as you say, Lionel, it's it's very clear, surely, to everybody that this will not happen unless it's approved at the very highest level of French society and government. And it's not going to happen if the authorities in France, who are obviously taking coronavirus extremely seriously, deem it to be unsafe. And so those conditions will have to be there for it to happen. Um, But, you know, I, I, I find it odd because for ASO, the Tour de France is their business. And I think it doesn't matter what size of business you are, big or small, Every business wants to resume its activity um, 
because if it doesn't, then the business ceases to exist. And and I don't think the tour is any different to any other business. It seems to me completely understandable that A, they would want to hold the tour this year and B, that they would want to come up with a plan for doing so as, as early as possible. Yeah, I was, I've was i been slightly dismayed by some of the commentary about it, Rich, as well. Um, you know, sort of opinion pieces or pronouncements to the effect that, um, well, from cycling journalists who... who T- to be honest, um, I don't think really, I don't think we have any insight to bring to this um, situation yet beyond possibly, and I think over the next two or three months, reporting on what is actually happening at ASO, what they are actually trying to put in place um, vis-a-vis um, things like crowds and, and also, you know, what the, the anti-doping authorities are putting into place, which is a, a very, very important um, consideration as well but um, you know I don't think we have any real insight on the the virus itself the spread of the pandemic um, you know that the, the leading authorities in in Europe and in the world are, are baffled by certain aspects of you know what's happening with the virus um, you know how the body fights it how the immune system reacts to it um, you know estimates over the infection rate are varying hugely um, one of the well the main sort of mouthpiece um, of the the effort the fight um, against coronavirus in Germany who has been sort of held up um, throughout the world as as you know a great authority on it Christian Drossen um, has been on TV in Germany this week sort of talking about the infection rate and and he even is saying that he doesn't know whether it's sort of 0.2 or 0.7 if you sort of scale that to millions of people then you're talking about difference of of, of millions of people worst case versus best case scenario so we really we really don't know so um you know as i said these these kind of opinion pieces almost accusing the tone of which is almost to accuse aso um already of a crime that we don't we don't know and we suspect they're not minded to commit i.e. endangering and imperiling the health of riders and um, they have to put a marker down they have to act as though the tour is going to happen but um you know how would we we react to opinion pieces um sort of 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 the or to the effect of Nairo Quintana must not dope at the Tour de France this year i mean it's a it's <laughs> it's hugely prejudicial and it's assuming that um you know someone is going to do something which is which is damaging and unconscionable and it's not, irresponsible it's also stating the obvious um you know it's equally obvious to say that the tour will not go ahead unless it's deemed safe by the authorities but you also can't organise an event as complex as the Tour de France at the drop of a hat. So if they are looking at the end of August, they they have to check that every town that had signed up for a July June July slot is still happy to host, and that the the logistics is. Uh, are possible and that the the money is still there and all of those things have to be planned for and checked so it's it's really a case of ASO doing their due diligence to ensure that when there is a resumption they're able to 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 put on a race they can't just say okay lads um the tour starts next Saturday on you on you go they have to continue working as if there's going to be a resumption and then when they reach a kind of tipping point that if August the 29th is not realistic and they push it back then you know there's further discussion and further um, considerations I, I, I don't see how they could really be expected to act in any other way and I think Daniel one of the points you made when we've been discussing this um, over the last week is that the impression that people may have that that ASO is sort of an Amazon or Google or Facebook sized you know giant global business whereas in fact its turnover is around about 500 million euros a year which puts it in the same bracket as Manchester United which is one football club the tour itself apparently accounts for about 150 million euros in turnover uh, ASO is you know famously quite secretive about these numbers these are these are numbers that, that Francois Tomaso has, has, has given as a, as a well-educated estimate but 150 million turnover for the Tour de France puts it in the same sort of bracket as League One football or the Scottish Premier League Richard to uh, um, so it's not like it's uh, the NFL of the pinnacle of world sport in other words (laughs) we're not talking about the NFL here or you know the Olympic Games are we we're talking about in the global sporting landscape one of the minnows 
Yet, on the other side, the Tour de France is a hugely prestigious and important um, fixture in the French sporting and cultural calendar. And, you know, I don't see there's... uh, It's odd to expect them to do anything other than plan for it going ahead at some point. And... uh, well, you know, we, we well, will have and, to wait and see, but they're not going to do it if it compromises the, the no. safety of riders. There, there are two aspects: there's the riders and also the, uh, the the spectators and how they manage the crowds. I, I think, you know, we don't know, but um, I think people will still be doing a lot of self policing at, at that point and probably avoiding crowds. I, I don't know; you can't rely on that. Um, but one thing I hadn't really thought about, which um, Mike Wood said, uh, was about the riders themselves and how vulnerable they might be to this infection. And as you say, Daniel, um, reactions to it vary enormously, and we don't really understand that yet. But what's clear is that, um, you know, we've seen it with a lot of health workers. When immune systems are compromised, you can be more vulnerable to it, it would appear. And riders in the third week of a Grand Tour um, can certainly have compromised immune systems. You know, when we wander around the buses, you can see riders with cold sores, um, riders who are ill, who are fighting off coughs and colds and so on, uh, all signs of compromised immune systems. Um, so here's what Mike Woods had to say briefly on that. Classic athlete mentality where like you don't care really about your personal health, you just care about the the pursuit of what you're doing and the glory of, of winning. And like I... It didn't dawn on to me until, until uh, I was talking to somebody else about it, but they're like, well, aren't you actually worried about your own health? And I thought about it. And like every time I do the Giro, for example, I come apart from a lungs per, in, in the lungs. Like I, I, I get terrible seasonal allergies. I get I'll always, every time I've done it, I've come down with a terrible case of bronchitis to the extent that like I'm, I can hardly breathe by the end thing. If, if I were to have that and then I would get coronavirus, I could actually be a person that's, you know, extremely, extremely vulnerable and, so yeah, you got like you, you couple that with like Grand Tour riding, and that, that doesn't necessarily. It's not a like we yeah we're worried about spreading it, but that actually could be a real threat. Imagine if a rider died because they did the tour. So I thought that was quite interesting. Not something I'd thought about, um, and I think there has been this perception that people have had, including myself, that that this coronavirus only really affects people who are either old or with underlying health problems and um, that that's clearly the the case in the majority of cases but not always and mike woods there acknowledging that he hadn't until recently considered himself you know potentially vulnerable to it but who knows yeah who knows is exactly right rich and um you know the news um is moving so so quickly at the moment and um, hopefully people's understanding and experts real experts understanding um, of how people are infected why they're infected when they're infected will also continue to move quickly and you know we are we're four months basically since the start of the outbreak and it's more than four months till the Tour de France so you know a lot of these questions um, I feel don't really have to be posed um, until or for another few weeks yet i'm sure aso and well more importantly the french government will be trying to answer them already but um you know we we've talked a bit over the last few years about particularly in the social media age um it it seeming to at times to be more important to be first than to be right or even reasonable and never more so than than now do we need to remember that um you know, it is it is important to be rational and reasonable and take our time. Everyone take their time um, in in making judgments um, on this on this situation and um, and taking the right decisions. And it is also worth pointing out or or, or or suggesting that as important as the Giro and the Classics and the Vuelta and, and everything else is, even the World Championships, the Tour de France is uh, the glue that holds the entire sport together. And I'm sure if you did a straw poll of the, the, the World Tour teams and said, which event is the most important to you commercially and to your sponsors, over the course of the season, the the standout answer would be the Tour de France. And so even just thinking from our point of view in the media, I mean, from my days when I worked for a newspaper, if, you, if you'd said to the sports editor, right, the cycling's back, Chris Froome, Megan Bernard, Geraint Thomas, they're all going to be riding the Giro d'Italia, which is starting first. Um, it wouldn't punch the same hole as uh, as the Tour de France. The Tour de France, you know, is on such a, uh, uh, you know, it's on another 
two or three shelves up from everything else, isn't it? Just to play devil's advocate a little bit, Lionel, I think a lot of race organisers over the last week or so um, and, and other sort of stakeholders in cycling have been a bit aggrieved at the fact that it is the Tour de France clearly calling all the shots um, and sort of even the U- UCI is has moved in behind ASO and um, has put out even a press release sort of uh, making it very clear that ASO are calling the shots and um, some people will feel and certainly the likes of RCS, the Giro organisers will feel that and um, they've been probably poorly treated here and also that this is maybe a missed opportunity to re- redress some of that balance that um, you, you know is it healthy to have the Tour de France um, exerting almost a monopoly in terms of influence over the sport this was maybe um, an opportunity to to give more parity of voice and and opportunity to some of the other races well somebody I asked about the 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 redesigned calendar and the chances of it of it happening uh, is a former Tour de France winner. Yes, he won the Tour de France, Geraint Thomas, didn't he? Famously, um, having not been written off by anyone at all, uh, Geraint Thomas, twenty eighteen Tour de France winner. Um, I spoke to him as I mentioned earlier while he was peddling away on his well day two of his uh, three day twelve hour challenge to raise money for the nhs he was at home in cardiff um here's what he had to say Geraint thomas how are you yeah a bit tired actually <laughs> how many hours now i think i've got five to go five so, to uh, go yeah just i think uh yesterday i forgot to kind of eat first half the ride so so busy doing interviews and stuff and Skype dropping out and all this technical stuff, so uh, mm. kind of paying a bit of a price for that. But oh, this sore as well, as you can imagine, the old uh, the old undercarriage. Well, with, with your experience of yesterday, I mean, is this about the toughest part? You know, you're just just over halfway through. Have you sort of figured out? Is it like a long haul flight when sort of the third to fourth hour are the worst? Yeah, I've just been chatting to my wife actually, and uh, just saying. This is kind of the middle of the day, obviously, is the hardest, I think, because at least tomorrow's the last day and you're just counting down to the actual finish. Whereas, you know, you had the whole, uh, well, obviously it started yesterday, so you're doing all the interviews about, about it and, you know, a bit of a buzz around it. And today's a bit of a flat, a bit of a lull, really. So even though saying that, the donations are still coming in. So that's really good to see. That does give you a boost. I think I just need to start smashing that coffee machine now well i mean that's obviously why they scheduled my call for this time just to maybe lift you up a bit (laughs) yeah definitely definitely to tell you that you can definitely do it it's not fanciful (laughs) at all to imagine that you're gonna you're gonna complete (laughs) this challenge um what was the what was inspiration for it uh well i wanted to do something because obviously Ineos and the team are doing their hands-on project with the hand sanitizers and that um supplying it to hospitals all over the uk but Obviously, uh, I'm part of the team, but I wasn't directly involved. You know, I didn't actually do anything. So I wanted to do something. Um, you know, my mum went back to work in uh, Cancer Hospital here in Cardiff. My mother-in-law used to be a midwife. Um, you know, my best man is a GP up in uh, St. Helens. And then just hearing all the stories about NHS workers, what they're doing. Um, so yeah, I just thought the best way I could sort of help out, contribute in any small way was trying to raise a bit of money. And I thought if I've got to, you know, do a charity ride, people aren't going to sponsor me to ride hundred miles, are they really? So I thought I'd try and mirror an NHS workers shift. And that's when we come up with the idea of doing three back to back 12 hour rides. And, uh, well, I'm kind of thinking, could I not have just done one? But but then we wouldn't have raised so much. So well, it's uh, yeah, good on you. I mean, y- you. I mean, you obviously have direct sort of experience, or or you know, people that you know well who are very much on the front line. And and have you had a sense from them of of just how tough things are? Yeah, I think. Uh, oh, lucky my mum. Well, 
lucky might be the wrong word, but my mum, obviously it's a cancer hospital, so they're really sort of vulnerable. So they've all got the, the, the PPE, all the protective stuff. And so they're well looked after in that regard. Uh, my mate up north is not too bad up there at the moment, so they're kind of doing okay. But just the situation in the country, you know, you know, Principality Stadium in Cardiff, you know, being converted into a temporary hospital, it's just uh, bonkers, really. So, and just seeing what everyone's doing, it was, uh, yeah, just rough thought, you know, I'm not doing anything, you know, it's not like I'm at a race or at a training camp or, you know, we're, we're locked in. So, uh, saying that, I've got a six month old, so mm. dealing with him is, uh, well, it's full on. I could do with a race, to be honest. Yeah. A rest. Yeah. <laughs> 12 hours, but, uh, 12 hours yeah. away from the six month old. That's, uh, that's, that's something at least. Yeah. It's a bit extreme, isn't it? Three, 12 hour rides just to get away from a six month old for a bit. Um, to have a night's sleep. Uh, how, how are you finding it generally? I mean, uh, you know, you're three, four weeks into training, uh, more, well, more or less exclusively indoors. Now. I mean, how, how do you find that generally? I've kind of been okay because I had to, I had a bit of a break towards the start of the whole lockdown because I've done a big, big block of training since Hogarb. I started uh, more or less straight after the race and I've got a good block in and uh, obviously Tirena was also kept training and then so the first week or so I was just chilling and recovering really so the main thing at the moment is just been trying to maintain a bit of uh, fitness and not put too much weight on. Uh, it's... Uh, which is quite hard when you're locked in your house, really, and the kitchen is just there. You know there's a full, full fridge. It's quite easy to uh, be tempted to just go in and start picking stuff out. But, uh, yeah, it's been, it hasn't been as bad as what, you know, if you told me start of the year this was going to happen. Um, but I think the main thing is mentally staying, just trying to stay fresh and on it. And uh, and now, obviously, with the news, was it today or yesterday? Yesterday, yeah, now. yeah. Yeah, uh, but the tour actually has a date. It gives us something to work towards. Whether it happens or not is another question, but at least we have a date now to sort of work towards. Yeah, I mean, psychologically, is that is that important to just look at a, a, a time where, you know, there are, at least, there are at least races kind of in the calendar now? Yeah, it helps, for sure. Like, before when we were kind of like, just, yeah, keep training. Like, when are we going to race? We don't know, but just keep training. At least there is a date now, and uh, hopefully the tour can go ahead because it's the pinnacle, and it's what, especially in the UK, that's what cycling is. You know, if you ask anyone, say three words about cycling, the tour or yellow jersey or something like that will be in there. So, uh, yeah, hopefully, uh, hopefully it happens. How how difficult? I mean, presumably you'll. I mean, we're still allowed outside in in the UK, and presumably lockdown restrictions will be eased a bit. So. Riders will be able to train on the roads, but they'll have spent a lot of time not training on the roads and not racing. How strange would that would that be? You know, doing the tour after say two or three weeks of racing, and do you think we'd see some unusual results? Yeah, I think it could be a, a very different tour. Um, you know, especially different countries. Like people in France have been fully locked down for a while now. Um, you know, like you say, at least in the UK, we still go out on the road for a bit. Um, so, yeah, I think, to be honest, I'll just be grateful that we're through it because, obviously, if the tour happens, that means it's safe to do so and we're out of the worst of it. So, And I'll just be happy to be racing my bike again. But in the same breath, you you, you want to win or you want to be performing at the top. So, yeah, it'll be interesting. I think it will be a big, uh, a big variety. I mean, speaking, to, speaking to some riders... Um, a lot of riders seem to think that that some will cope better than others with this lockdown, as you'd expect, and that and that there are riders out there who are almost looking at it as an opportunity, thinking if I don't crack, if I keep my discipline, um, if I stay out the fridge and and the the brains beer, stay off the brains beer, <laughs> um, you know, it could it could actually weirdly be a, an opportunity to come back and 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 be pretty competitive. Is that is that how you think as well? Yeah, definitely. I think there's a lot of guys that will, uh, you know, I think the top guys, especially GC guys and that, I think they'll all be, you know, they're kind of used to 
bit of a strange lifestyle anyway, you know. Um, they're all a bit weird, aren't they? So I just, uh, I think they'll be able to train well. Uh, they don't put too much weight on anyway. Like the problem for me is obviously in the winter, I do let my hair down and the weight comes on then. But I do put weight on quite easy anyway. So that's the biggest challenge for me at the minute. But uh, yeah, I think people will be, once we're allowed back on the roads and racing, I think there'll be a big variety between people's level. Like I think there'll be some guys around 60%. There'll be other guys that are still, you know, 90 odd. Uh, and yeah, like you say, if there's only a month, six weeks of racing before the tour, then well, it'll be really uh, interesting. Like I think that last week will just be bodies everywhere. And uh, we could get, uh, we could definitely have a surprise, like maybe not a surprise winner, but a surprise podium or, you know, some guys in the top 10, you'd be like, oh, I didn't really ever expect that. But it'll be interesting for the fans anyway. How much do you, I mean, your your team as a, as a big uh, sponsor, but obviously some teams are quite vulnerable to their not being racing. How much do you worry about the, the, the wider sport and the implications of this on the on the sport professional cycling? Yeah, that is a worry. I think that's a good thing that if the tour is on, um, that'll help those teams massively because, you know, for them, the whole reason, probably 90, 80%, whatever it is, of the sponsors in the sport come into it because of the tour you know they come into it because they want to be in the tour they want to win the tour um so yeah for it to happen i think that would be a big plus point for them uh but yeah i think it's the whole economy is struggling you know at the moment and the way our sport is you know we're solely reliant on sponsorship and if one of those companies goes through a hard time then you know the money they're putting into a cycling team might be one of the first, the first things that they cut so it's tough but um yeah hopefully we're through it quick and uh yeah the sooner the we're back racing then the better obviously but obviously first and foremost you've got to uh everyone's got to be safe haven't they i mean i, I got the impression just following on, on social media and so on that you had a really good winter that you you put in a lot of work this winter so it must be it must be massively frustrating not to be able to to race and show you know show show the fruits of that work. Yeah, it is. Yeah, like I did have a good winter and our garb was decent. And then after our garb, it felt like I really made a good step forward. Like I said before, I had a good block of training, a like really good training. Uh, the weight was decent, and I was ready for you know a good Tirreno. That was obviously canned, but then. I've my, put my focus on to Catalonia, even though deep down I kind of knew it probably be cancelled as well, but or postponed. Um, so yeah, that's frustrating, but it is what it is, and uh, you know there's nothing you can do about it. It's all being done for the right reasons. You just have to stay positive and keep looking forward, and it's the same for everyone, really. But yeah, definitely like we said before as well, you know, other guys, well. A lot of guys will come out of it really good. Others will it'll take a while to get going and they might not have that time this year. And I'll let you get on, Geraint, because I'm sure it's not easy to ride and, and talk. What what sort of wattage are you putting out at the moment? Uh, at the moment, 200, 220. My uh, average is 195, actually, so... That's quite high. Yeah, I mean, two, <laughs> two, 220 is not far off an effort for me, so that's uh, that's impressive. <laughs> um, just, yeah. uh, I mean, with, with the, the redrawn uh, calendar, you know, if, if it happens and if the tour is quite early in that, you might have a chance to go for a, a classic after the tour. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it depends on how it'll be a completely different year to what we're used to. And if the tour does happen and finishes 20th of September... You know, you got the Worlds a week later. Like, I haven't never had a good Worlds, but this might be my chance to have a decent Worlds. And then, yeah, like you say, if the Classics are in October, then, and I'm still feeling fresh, motivated, and, and good, obviously, that's the main thing, then you never know. But uh, it's all, we're still speculating and hoping, really, at the moment. But 
as soon as hopefully we're through this and UCI with you know race organizers and the teams can come up with a a good uh like backup calendar I guess the better great well listen good luck and uh well done on on your fundraising efforts and I hope the uh hope the next five hours fly by well, that was Geraint Thomas. Uh, well done to him for his efforts in raising money. Lots of riders have been doing um, pretty positive things to, to help out. Um, and, uh, yeah, well done to him. Uh, he obviously had some thoughts on the, the, the calendar as well and whether the, whether the races will happen. Um, we'll just keep an eye on that and talk about it over the next few weeks. One thing I forgot to mention in the, the coronavirus news was, was Peter Sagan's quote. Uh, saying he's a real cyclist, not a virtual one, which um, goes well, without Alejandro saying. Valverde and Verde and Alejandro Valverde and Thibaut Pino um, have expressed similar sentiments, haven't they? Yeah, I, I would have expected such a thing from Sagan. I must admit, he's a very sort of almost primal, animalistic sort of athlete, isn't he? Um, I can't really imagine him as a. I can imagine him as a sort of character, as a superhero sort of character in a computer game but not so much playing a computer game. But Pino strikes me as somebody who would be drawn more to the outdoors and the exploration of, of, of riding your bike in the fresh air. And Valverde's a racer, isn't he? I mean, he's just a pure racer. And I imagine, you, you imagine, and I'm, I, think, I think I think it even more, having watched the Movistar Netflix series, that what he needs is, you know, people to line up alongside and to... Um, to take on, uh, and so I, I imagine that's what that's what gets Alejandro Valverde up in the morning, beating people. Yeah, I think. Well, yeah, I think um, it's well known that Valverde has a big group in Murcia that he he rides with um, almost every day, and yeah, it's sort of bringing out and accentuating um, the the things in each individual rider, and this applies, I guess, to amateurs as well, people at home. Um, what draws them to cycling you know for some it's the exploration and adventure and the outdoors um for others who maybe um are more drawn to to e-racing it's it's the watts and the um you know being able to sort of get biofeedback on um on exactly what they're doing on a bike and for others it's a social Mm. thing now there is something a major event coming up of course um the calendar is not empty we've got our giro how are preparations coming along for that daniel very well i think um you've seen some of the the stage profiles that you um you may well be be sort of testing your credentials or we might be testing your credentials on um a bit more about that maybe in the in the coming couple of weeks but we've been doing interviews haven't we and the the pieces of the jigsaw are fitting together quite nicely our our Giro will start on May the 9th when the Giro would have started and we'll have daily episodes throughout. Um, can we say any more at the moment? Or are we going to save it for a big reveal? Oh, save it, I think. Save it. Great. Okay. Well, it's exciting. Um, We've got some, I feel yeah, quite enthused yeah. by it. Mm, very. Great. Very. Well, I'm giddy, we... Daniel. I'm giddy, giddy about the Giro. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah you look it. You sound <laughs> yeah, yeah. it, yeah. Shall we wrap things up for this week then, chaps? Yes, let's. Okay, well, before we go, some thank yous to friends of the podcast. From me, big thanks to Carlos Rice, Alex Gidley, Sue Gilmore and Doug Forer, Willard Foote, Nick Cooper, Adrian Beer, Pierre Bernard Tifo, William Martino, Daniel Kelly and Andrew Munton. And a big thank you to Kevin Egan, Dave Martin, Mark L. Heed, Steve Wilson, Andy Cummings, Thomas Mann, Graham Cheryl, Nathan Carden, Will Laffin and Barry Mooney. From me to Alistair Lovett, Keith Prothero, Matt Line, Lars Stein Tyholt, Colin Tierney, Roddy Cunningham, Sam Radakovich, Anthony Massey, Rod Carroll, Ron Carraway, and Ian Nelson. Thank you, chaps. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Richard. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate us and leave a review on Facebook and iTunes. Just search online for The Cycling Podcast. This episode was edited and produced by Adam Bowie.